I'll introduce myself in a second. Let me go ahead and quickly introduce Mark Lundstrom, our acting dean, and Mark is gonna kick off things for us today. So Mark, why don't you go ahead and start? Mark, I'm afraid you're muted. <laughs> muted a minute ago, thank you. So good morning again. So it's a real pleasure to be here and to be celebrating your 75th anniversary together. I'm Mark Lundstrom. I'm the acting dean of the college this year. I've been a faculty member here for quite a few years. Uh, I know all of the panelists, the current and former heads. In fact, I go back six heads. Uh, I had the pleasure of serving as assistant dean in Henry Yang's office while, while he was here. So it's a, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be with you this morning. Now, as you know, Purdue University was established in 1869. In the 2018-2019 academic year, we celebrated our 150th anniversary. And President Daniel said that he didn't want to spend a lot of time celebrating all of our accomplishments. He wanted to, to look to the future. Now, early on, we, the uh, engineering programs were established. I believe civil engineering programs were taught right from the beginning. And the School of Civil Engineering was established in 1874. So that's 146 years ago. Uh, the Schools of Engineering or the College of Engineering was established in 1900. At that time, there were three departments or schools, civil engineering, mechanical engineering, and electrical engineering. So this year we're celebrating the 120th anniversary of the College of Engineering. And uh, there's a lot of accomplishments to celebrate. Things like the fact that Lillian Gilbreth was the first female engineering professor in the US and the first member of the first female member of the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, the nation's first freshman engineering program was created here in 1953. The first electronic transmission of television occurred here in 1931. And the chief designer of the Golden Gate Bridge, which was opened in 1937, was a Purdue professor, Charles Ellis. The nation's first women in engineering program was started here in 1969. Uh, we're the birthplace of the National Society of Black Engineers. That was created in 1975. We're the founding site of the EPICS program, Engineering Projects in Community Service, which was launched in 1995. And we have the very first department, which is now a school of engineering education. So as for Purdue's 150th celebration, you know, we're spending the year looking to the future in the college. Uh, one thing we're looking to the future in is um, emerging research areas and areas that are important, not only for the future of society, but for the future of every strong engineering college. We have launched three Purdue engineering initiatives, teams of faculty that are focusing on five, I'm sorry, five important areas. Uh, one is data in engineering applications. A number, another is the combination of engineering and medicine. A third is autonomous and connected systems. A fourth has to do with innovation and making and uh, leading to industry 4.0. And the fifth has to do with cislunar space and is spearheaded by, by this school. So these are exciting initiatives. Uh, about two months ago, NSF announced four new engineering research centers Two of those four centers has major contributions from Purdue, one having to do with electric vehicles and another having to do with sensors and technology, internet of things, technology for precision agriculture. So lots of exciting things are happening. People are dreaming big dreams for the future. Uh, Cislunar Space has some especially ambitious plans that they're talking about. Now you all are celebrating your 75th anniversary. There are a lot of milestones that we could point out there. Uh, I believe in 1945 is when the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics was first established as a separate school. In 1963, you established the astronaut program, which started with a master's of astronaut, astronautics degree program for Air Force Academy graduates. In 1967, he moved to the third floor of a renovated civil engineering building, which then was dedicated as Grissom Hall in 1968. Uh, in 1973, you acquired your current name. In 1996, you conducted the first Purdue Fall Space Day. And in 2007, the Neil Armstrong Hall of Engineering was dedicated, and that's where you and I are both located now. 
And along the way, there are lots of accomplishments to celebrate. 16 of Purdue's 25 astronauts have degrees from this school. Uh, the school is the home to the world's first Mach 6 quiet hypersonic, uh, quiet flow hypersonic tunnel. Uh, this school is a partner in the Zucro Laboratories, the largest university rocket and gas turbine propulsion lab in the world. Uh, you're setting an all-time record in enrollment in fall 2020 with 1,548 students, 960 of them undergrads and 588 of them graduate students. And you may well set another record next fall. <laughs> Bill, Bill has, and you all have, Mixed feelings, but it is a good problem to have. Uh, over 11,000 degrees have been awarded from this uh, from this school. So, lots of uh, lots of wonderful accomplishments to celebrate. Lots to look forward to in the future. So, it's a real pleasure to uh, to introduce the panel. I had the pleasure when I stepped into uh, my position as acting deans about chairing a panel of former deans. And uh, I got a lot of good advice. I don't know what exactly what Bill has planned when he mod is moderating this panel, but it's really get to get to a good opportunity to tap on the wisdom and experience of some of your predecessors, Bill. So, uh, so let, let me uh, in introduce the panelists. Um, and as I, as I said, I had the pleasure of meeting and knowing all of them. So Alton F. Skip Grant was head from 1985 to 1992. Uh, Skip is the Purdue University uh, Raysback Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Aeronautics and Astronautics. He joined Purdue in 1979, served as head from 1985 to 92, retired in 2016. His technical interests include damage tolerance, structural analysis, design, fatigue and fracture, and non-destructive inspe inspection. He's the author of a textbook on structural integrity, and a textbook on the history of the Purdue School of Aeronautics and Astronautics. John Sullivan was head from 1993 to 1998. I know John is his role as a professor and head, and also because we talked about motorcycles together. So John is a professor in the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Uh, he, in 1975, he joined the faculty here at Purdue after moving from a small uh, high technology startup in California that he had co-founded. He has a wide variety of administrative experience at Purdue, including director of the Center for Advanced Manufacturing and other programs. Uh, his research area is in the area of experimental aeronautics and fluid mechanics with an emphasis on optical instrumentation. And his recent work has centered on the use of molecular sensors for engineering measurements and resulted in a book, Pressure and Temperature Sensitive Paint. Okay. Uh, our third panelist is Tom Ferris. Tom was head from 1998 to 2009. He currently serves as Dean of Engineering at Rutgers University. Uh, prior to, uh, uh, prior to Rutgers, uh, uh, Tom was a faculty member for a long time here at Purdue. He joined as an assistant professor, rose to the ranks, and eventually served as head. His research interests are in aerospace structures and materials with a focus on tribology, manufacturing processes, and fatigue and fracture. He's received many awards for this research, and his research in fretting fatigue led to computer software that is now used throughout the aircraft industry. Our fourth panelist is Tom Shi. Tom was head from 2009 to 2019. Uh, he's professor of aeronautics and astronautics. Uh, prior to joining Purdue in 2009, he was a mechanical engineer at NASA Glenn Research Center, served on the faculty of University of Florida, Carnegie Mellon, Michigan State, and Iowa State University. Tom's research interests are in computational fluid dynamics and gas turbine aerodynamics and heat transfer and thermal management of aerospace systems. And he's won several awards for this work. He, Tom currently serves as chair or as a member of several committees and boards, including NASA, three different university committees, uh, the AIAA and the ASME. And our moderator for the discussion is the current head Bill Crosley, who um, 
started this position in 2019. Bill is, the, is a professor and the J. William Urig and Anastasia Vernos, head of aeronautics and astronautics. He's been a faculty member here since 1995. He's also director for the Partnership to Enhance General Aviation Safety, Accessibility, and Sustainability, which is the FAA's Center of Excellence for General Aviation. Uh, um, Bill earned his master's and his PhD while working for McDonnell Douglas Helicopter Systems. At Purdue, Bill has received teaching awards from his school, from the college, and from the university. And he serves on several committees uh, as chair or as uh, members of the committees uh, for several different organizations. So with that, I think I will turn the panel discussion over to Bill, and I look forward to staying with you for, for a few minutes. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Mark. And, and, and thanks for introducing everybody. It's, it's nice to know that you know all of us and have had that continuity through here. Um, let me let me describe the flow of, of the event today. So we'll start with a couple of introductory statements from, from all of us. And then I've got some prepared questions that I'll try to lead the, the heads through. And then those of you in the audience, you can type in your questions as you go as we go along. And near the end of the event today, we'll we'll go through those questions. And so if you use the chat window, that's okay. We'll try to figure that out as well. But there's a QA window on the WebEx you can use here. So one of the things that Mark just did to, to introduce us mentioned that Skip had written a couple of books, and one of those books was the history of the school. And, and I know from talking with Skip over the years when we've overlapped with each other, one of his favorite activities here at Purdue has been essentially our historian and has kept track of a lot of different uh, milestones and information about the school. So Skip actually prepared a short set of PowerPoint slides to kind of go through the heads of the school. So Skip, let me go ahead and turn that over to you and you can lead us through this look back at our, at our predecessors and up to us today. Yeah, if I can figure out how to do this. Sorry, I'm a little obsolete on this kind of stuff. Yeah, um, as, as Bill said, one of my favorite things has uh, been in his school was uh, to uh, You have to jump to the front, Skip. It looks like that's the closing slide. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. What is the right this book? Okay. And I'll put in a plug for the book. It is available on the, on the website. It talks about the history of uh, aeronautics that produced starting back in 1910. Now, for this particular presentation, I thought it would be good to review the the heads. So the heads, and I'm going to. You know, we're officially celebrating our birthday in uh, 19, July of 1945, but Arrow started at Purdue well before that. In 1910, there was actually a Purdue Aeronautics Club, and that was in the School of Mechanical Engineering. So I thought I would review quickly some of the heads that were involved before our official birthday, before we became independent, and uh, then after we were independent. Now, Originally, things started, as I said, in mechanical engineering. The first classes in aeronautics were in mechanical engineering. And the head of that department at that time was Gilbert Young. He was head from 1912 to 42. I don't know if any of the current panelists would like to comment on being head for 30 years. To me, that seems like a long time. But significant things were, were happened there. So he oversaw the development of the first aero courses. It was a fairly low level effort until World War II when it picked up speed. Then World War II, um, things picked up speed. And actually, um, Harry Solberg was head of ME at that time. And in 1942, ME actually changed their name to the School of Mechanical and Aeronautical Engineering. So he was head of the first program that actually offered degrees. Another significant thing he did as a good head was he gave an assignment to his faculty and he said, what are we going to do when the war ends? And so they formed a plan, which, which led to the independent school of uh, aeronautics. So here are the heads in, since our official birthday. There have been uh, 13 heads. 
and then there was one advisory committee. The first head that showed up here was Elmer Brun. He was head for five years from 45 to 50. There's Elmer over here. And then he was succeeded by Milton Clauser, who came from industry. He actually was uh, at Douglas. And then he came to Purdue for four years. He was head, then he went back to Douglas. Then the next head was Harold DeGroff. He was a long-term member of the faculty. Uh, and he was head from 54 to 63. So nine years he was involved. And then we had an interim head. In the 60s, we merged with uh, engineering sciences and, and there was some fairly turbulent period. And Paul was, uh, Sammy was interim head uh, for that period, for a period. And then they decided that um, we needed to have a committee. So they didn't have a head. From 1965 to 67, there was actually a committee. Those of you baseball fans may remember that the Cubs, uh, Chicago Cubs, had an advisory committee for during that period too, during the 60s. They didn't actually have a manager, they had a head. And I think that advisory committee was probably as successful as the Cubs were during that period. But at any rate, there was an advisory committee which uh, consisted of uh, several people. Then following the, the advisory committee, Shu Luo, he had been a member of the advisory committee. He was chair of the department. Well, the, actually the advisory committee was, Shu Luo was chair, Steve Citron, Robert Goulard, Paul Stanley, and Irv Sitz were faculty members who were on the advisory committee. And then Shu Luo became head from 67 to 71. And then he was succeeded for two years by Jack McDonough, who had been part of the engineering sciences program. The engineering sciences program, part of the arrow was disbanded in 72, and Jack was succeeded by Bruce Reese. So he was head from 73 to 79. Now Bruce was the uh, one who hired me, so he was the first of the heads that I actually knew. Uh, he was head for six years, I guess, and then was succeeded by Henry Yang. Henry was head for 79 to 84, and then of course he was moved to Dean of Engineering for 10 years, and then he's moved on and has been Chancellor of the University of California, Santa Barbara. Okay, and then I had the pleasure of honor of succeeding Henry for seven years from 85 to 92. And then John Sullen succeeded me from 93 to 98. And then Tom Ferris from 98 to, to 2009. I think Tom has the distinction of being the longest serving of the department heads. And then uh, he was succeeded by Tom Shee, nine years, and then of course Bill Crosby the last year. So those are the uh, the heads that uh, we're celebrating. And so I guess I'll stop sharing. Great. Well, thanks, Skip. That just gives a nice picture. And I guess I hadn't fully appreciated that I was the 13th head. So, of course, I was the one that gets the COVID. So <laughs> maybe that's just part of what happens. I don't know. So well, thanks, Skip. I appreciate that. So, so Skip, I know we, Mark gave us a great introduction. And in our, in our little guideline here, we were supposed to then sort of give an introductory statement. So Maybe rather than going through all the details about how long you were ahead, because we heard all that, right. maybe just a couple couple things about, you know, what prompted you to become head, and and what are you doing now, that since you since you stepped down from being head. Well, I guess prompted to be head was, was encouraged, you know, by a, a few faculty members, and and then I think really really I felt it was sort of a service service duty. I felt that you know, faculty need to serve things, and I thought that was a good thing to do, and so that's why I guess I applied for it. Um, What was the thing you wanted to say? I'm just what have you been doing since you've been head? I know you came back to the faculty, but some, some of us don't know you since you've been retired, since uh, many of the faculty have joined and, and the students that are watching have been here in the school. Well, why don't I tell you about my, my first day as head? That's, that's, that's uh, okay. <laughs> to me, kind of an interesting thing. Yeah, I, I, my first day ahead was the 40th anniversary of the school. It's actually my 40th birthday too. Um, We had a we had a celebration that day. We had a cake, and um, one of the senior faculty came by while we were there and told me that the restroom was out of toilet paper. So it impressed up in me that there's lots of things that the head needs to do. <laughs> and then I also had an interview that day with the local television because it was the 40th anniversary. And of course, public relations is an important thing in the department. And I thought that went pretty good. Well, the next day, one of the senior faculty came by and told me, said, 
I saw you on TV last night, Skip. I saw you weren't wearing a tie. So that impressed upon me <laughs> that appearance is important for a head. So, you know, two, two very important lessons. So the first day of what a, what a head does. Uh, and then in, in that mode, learning the importance of public relations, six months later with a Challenger explosion. And I happened to be at the Lambert Fieldhouse working out that when that occurred, and I didn't see it, but when I got back to my office, there were like 40, 50 phone messages people had called, and that impressed upon me how important Purdue was in the, in the aerospace view of the country. That everybody wanted to know what Purdue was doing. I was very proud that day of how our faculty came into play and answered things. We had TV people from Indianapolis. We had them from Chicago. We had all kinds of people around. So it impressed upon me the relevance of the school nationally and internationally, and then more so the, the importance of the of the, uh, the, the community relations. Well, when I stepped aside in uh, 93, I guess, um, I, I'd had a sabbatical with, with, with Alcoa Technical Center. Uh, that was important. I can see how industry applies basic research, how to evaluate people. Um, when it came back, we also had a center. I was principal investigator of an aging aircraft center. It was a four-year program, $3 million program, which involved six faculty and about 20 graduate students. Uh, started teaching courses again, developed two new courses, wrote the book on, uh, well, the, the history, wrote the book on uh, damage tolerance, started teaching um, um, continuing education. I think I did that 14 times. So we got involved in a lot of things like that. Since I retired, still piddle around a little bit with things at school, but uh, enjoying retirement. Very good, so, Skip. Okay. And thanks. Hey, John, why don't we have you do something kind of similar? What 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 prompted you to apply to be head, and, and what are some of the things you've been doing since you've been head? I think you're muted. John, I think you're still muted. How's that? Now we're better. That's good. I double clicked. Um, in that era, uh, with Skip and I think Tom also, we sort of had a progression. Uh, we were uh, graduate chair and uh, associate uh, head of some sort, and then uh, natural uh, things are going well to uh, become head. And uh, uh, by far the biggest influence in that uh, process was Henry Yang. He sort of uh, and picked people to do that. Uh, so he had been head, now he's dean, and he knew everything about the school. So it's pretty hard to get uh, get anything uh, uh, by him. He knew your budget and every penny you spent uh, in doing that. But he was a great, uh, a, a great dean and a great head when he was here. Um, I think Mark went over most of the things uh, there. Uh, when I uh, stepped down as head, you know, you go. The, the saying is you go back to uh, teaching and research, which uh, which I did, but I had the opportunity to take some uh, leaves over the time period. I, I went out to uh, a Boeing company. I had the pleasure of working there for a year. This was uh, uh, during the development of the 787. Before it was called the 787, it was called Yellowstone, a project that was very secret within, and I got to sit in on high-level meetings there and learn a lot about their uh, design process, which has helped me a lot uh, over the years. Um, as Mark said, I, I was uh, director of the Center for Manufacturing for 10 years. And after that, I went to uh, NASA headquarters and spent uh, two years there. Um, uh, since then, I, I'm back uh, doing research. I've got uh, some of these projects that uh, issues that I never got done. I don't think never will get some of them done, but uh, working on uh, on uh, some projects there, uh, teaching um, design and uh, aerodynamics this semester in person, which is quite a different semester that we're having here, and continue doing that for a little bit more. Okay, thanks, John. So, Tom Ferris, you'd be the next in the chronological sequence here. 
Uh, uh, th thanks, Bill. It, it's it's good to see you. Um, you know, when you first sent the invitation, I I was really looking forward to getting back to Purdue and and seeing how things are and uh, seeing uh, lots of old friends there, um, including, of course, everybody on on this call. And just really appreciate you putting this together, Bill. And, Sure. Uh, sticking with it, uh, even though it's virtual. And uh, as John said, uh, well, uh, th things were going well at the school. I was serving as as chair of the graduate committee. And uh, when, when the opportunity uh, came up, uh, I, I sensed that it would be a, a very rewarding uh, opportunity and, and something that would be uh, really um, meaningful personally to do and uh it, it turned out that it really was it was it was much better than I, than i ever could have imagined it was um and uh especially now as as i've uh, been away for 11 years and uh rutgers is now part of the big 10 with you at purdue it's um uh, the, the the status that the School of Aero and Astro had on campus uh, was is is really quite special. Um, you mentioned Purdue, uh, Bill, and, and it's it's good for me to hear this. You're now the third largest school in the college by enrollment. Uh, th there was a time when that wasn't the case, and and uh, John may remember some some sort of struggles that were associated with those, those enrollments and so on. But, um, you know, the, the leadership of Purdue, you know, uh, President Beering and his interests with the astronauts, having having been a physician at NASA with the astronauts, and then uh, President Jiski coming in and actually having uh, the, the aerospace technical part of his background, and even France Cordoba, uh, who was chief scientist or something of the sort at NASA? The the notion that 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 uh, the status that the school had at Purdue was very rewarding, right? So so now that Mark is gone, right? There there might have been bigger jobs at Purdue, but there could not have been a job that's more re rewarding than uh, being head of Aero and Astro, and that that's reflected in in the status of our graduates out there in the world, right? And, uh, you know, with, with Skip and John's uh, encouragement, uh, you know, we started the Outstanding Aerospace Engineers Award and, uh, you know, the kinds of people that we were able to bring back for that um, are really spectacular. And, and wouldn't, wouldn't start naming names because you would leave someone out, but, successful people, uh, great people. Some of them I, I still correspond with uh, even now, 11 years having gone from, from Purdue. And uh, it was great to do that weekend. Um, Bill, you're probably too young uh, to have actually watched Neil Armstrong walk on the moon on TV. Uh, I, I watched it, but I have no conscious memory of it. <laughs> I have pictures of me uh, the TV. <laughs> but but I, I still remember the, the pleasure of being at Dr. Bering's house and and handing Mr. Armstrong his OAE award. And he whispered in my ear, he said, Tom, you've got the weight of the world on your shoulders. Uh, so just, just an example of, of the, the, the great Purdue people that are out there. Um, and I see the OAE as part of the timeline, of course, uh, working with the administration to get Neil Armstrong Hall of Engineering built was very rewarding. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to sort of be reminded that that our dear colleague CT Sun is represented there in the timeline through the CT Sun Research Award. Uh, and then I thank you for putting the notion of of establishing um, uh, uh, the the um, uh, uh, astronautical science and applications area and the aerospace systems area. I, I think that that did a lot to uh, broaden the participation of 
uh, faculty from underrepresented groups in our search process played a role in really uh, getting started with, with increasing the number of women on the faculty. And uh, I'm very glad to see that recognition there. Uh, did it for 11 years, could tell it was time for someone else to do it. And uh, uh, very pleased that, that you found Tom Shi at that point. Great, thanks Tom. Well, so Tom Shi, that leads right into you. Okay. Was I never muted? Okay. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, well uh, hello everyone, and um, and I thank all everyone for attending, and also congratulate uh, this wonderful school on its seventy uh, fifth anniversary. Uh, for me, actually, um, I can't hold on to a job, and uh, so I've been in a lot of places, and being head was actually never my aspiration. But I did go to Iowa State to become uh, their chair of aerospace engineering. I went there because they had a great CFD program. However, I haven't been in Iowa State. I, as Tom said, I found the job to be uh, incredibly rewarding. And uh, so when the job at um, Purdue opened up, I, I'm very grateful to Tom Ferris for, for telling me about it and also suggesting that I apply. And uh, so how can anyone turn down uh, you know, a, a, an opportunity at a school uh, as wonderful as uh, Purdue's uh, School of Aeronautics and Astronauts? So I applied and so I'm extremely honored and uh, I'm privileged to to be able to serve and uh, for, for ten years. Uh, on what I'm doing now is, uh, um, I uh, I grew up in a university town. I grew up in Morgantown, West Virginia. It's, uh, it's home of West Virginia University, and uh, so being a professor is the only job I knew. So that was something I've always wanted to do. And so, so now I can return full time to what I love to do: teaching research. So, so I'm having a lot of fun. Thank you. Again, it's an incredible honor and privilege to be a part of Purdue. I think I'm the uh, only head and uh, the first head to be recruited from the outside and also still the only head uh, from the outside. Okay, thank you. It's a real honor. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Yeah, and, and obviously I just started a little bit more than a year ago. And so the, the COVID has made it more challenging than I think I had ever anticipated, but it is still a quite rewarding job to have. Um, and, and part of mine, I think, matches what my colleagues and predecessors have said here. A combination of colleagues asking me to consider applying for the job and, and a, a desire to give back to the school that's let me do a lot of interesting things in my academic career. So I'm happy to be here. Um, we've got a few prepared questions, which, which some of you already hit on a little bit. Um, but one of the ones we talked about was to reflect a little bit on the history of the school. And so let me jump to one of them that maybe you didn't address in, in some of your comments. Can you think of something that happened while you were head that you think was really important, but may have kind of snuck under the radar a little bit or, or something that was, you know, not recognized maybe as much as it could have been. This would be your chance to get that recognition for it. So I don't know, maybe I'll go reverse. Tom, do you have, Tom Shee, do you have something that fits in that category? I'm sorry, this is um, the things that we, uh, could you repeat the question again? A bit? Sure, maybe something that happened while you were head yes. that you thought was really important but somehow it managed to just fly under the radar or or just didn't quite get the notice that you thought it should have had. And so this is your chance to kind of give it that notice. I see. Well, um, I, I'm sure there are many things that uh, were left to enter the radar that uh, we, I, I, that uh, maybe I, I didn't pay attention to. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, but, uh, let me let me think about this. I apologize. I, I thought it was going to be the last one. I'm going to take all the great advice from other people. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so while Tom Ferris kind of mentioned that the, the impact, for instance, Tom, if you want to pick this up, Tom, one of the things you mentioned was the impact of adding a couple different disciplinary areas opened okay. the door for us to you know attract some women faculty, which maybe okay. didn't get as big a deal as we as we might have made of it. Okay. How about this, Tom? Let me be, let me do do continue. Apologize. <laughs> okay. Well, I, as I said, I'm sure there are many things uh, done were flew under the radar. I think when things work well and when our reputation uh, continues to be outstanding as it is, I think in this extremely competitive world, I think it means that everybody's doing their job extremely well, and not occasionally, but every day. And and because our faculty, our staff, and our students, our alumni expect, I think, uh, nothing less than maybe excellence and of themselves, and that comes from the within. I think we do take things for granted, and thus I, 
That's one thing I think I deeply regret is that I, I think I have often not uh, expressed my gratitude uh, to, to those who have given so much of themselves to, to serve our department. Uh, and in particular, I think our staff uh, who are through the, uh, the heroes behind the things that make everything run so smoothly. And they're also the, the face uh, that when somebody comes to our department, that's the first people that they see. And so it is those little things, but uh, but they but they are so important. And I, I think that's the part I think that I wish I had given more recognition and more respect and, and, and expressed more gratitude for what they do. And, and that's it. <laughs> okay. All right. Bill, you are on mute now. Paris, but maybe you have something else that you think that was really important that maybe didn't get as much notice as, as you think it should have had. Uh, well, uh, again, Bill, thank you for, for calling out the, the aerospace systems and ASA. Um, uh, another thing that, that really um, started to gel uh, when I was there, which I, which I think now is very obvious, is uh, the, the partnership uh, with mechanical engineering around propulsion and what came, became the uh, Zucro labs and um, not not all of those sort of um, academic partnerships sort of have very smooth histories. I see John smiling and uh, uh, but uh, I, I think it it's it started coming together uh, nicely this this uh, uh, I, I, I hope I hope you all remember um, Elon Musk coming to the school and and spending actually several days with us because uh, uh, we were doing some some work with what became SpaceX uh, out there in, in the uh, propulsion labs and now look at where Elon Musk is in in, in the world and just a, an example of of where the Purdue uh, Aero School has has made an, an impact uh, out there. It's uh, uh, I remember going with Tim Bobello to visit Elon Musk and and talking about uh, wanting a ride for our uh, CubeSat, right? And he assured me he was looking for paying customers, right? So, <laughs> but uh, again, just just an example of, of the rewards uh, of the position. That was not something I got to do because of who I was, but it was actually being uh, head of Aero and Astro and, and how are we were doing this. Great, thanks, Tom. What about you, John? Is there something that fits that that fits that kind of character when you were head? Let me follow up a little bit on Zucro. Uh, Tom Ferris said, uh, look what happened to Elon Musk. And I'm going to say, look what happened to Zucro. I mean, that laboratory is just absolutely world-class, phenomenal place that it's grown to, to be. Uh, from, you know, it was down in the ashes there for a long time. And uh, the faculty came in and really brought that back. It's just uh, absolutely a fantastic place to go out to uh, and see what's going on now. Uh, so uh, Skip was saying uh, he was there for the 40th anniversary, and I uh, was there for the 50th anniversary in 1995. And we had some uh, speakers and uh, dinners and stuff associated with that. Uh, and like Skip, uh, it was his school's 50th, and it was also my 50th. And uh, so we had lots of celebrations. I think a couple of things. Um, one I, I was really proud of was to uh, nominate and uh, uh, get approved the uh, Distinguished Engineering Alumni for Lana Couch, who was the first woman DEA uh, that, the, uh, that the, the college had. And that was uh, really a pleasure, a pleasure to meet the woman uh, and see the things she had to do as the only woman in the wind tunnel program at Nara Langley and some of the things she had to do to get there. I'm really happy about that. I think the other thing was uh, Space Day. It's fall Space Day when we started that. Uh, started, started as a uh, idea to bring in an astronaut to talk to students, young students from uh, middle school primarily. And uh, well, my 
intention is to have hands-on, so we made it a hands-on activity for every student, about three to five hands-on activity uh, in that day. And it started out fairly small. I think there was under 100 for the first uh, first year. And uh, as I came in to uh, teach, I see boxes and boxes in the hallways of uh, Armstrong. And uh, Shell is out there. I said, there's got to be space day. And, he's, and I said, that's well, how many do you have? He says, 2,500, 2,500 middle school kids across the country are going to have produce fall space day. I mean, what an amazing thing that that should happen. So we've had to impact over 5,000 students uh, during that program. Um, the, the other thing was uh, we always had a strong uh, relationship with industry. But uh, uh, I got started the, uh, the first industrial advisor uh, committee that's uh, still ongoing. And Tom has added uh, an awful lot to it uh, in, in the last years. Uh, and uh, associated with that, we brought in the first development officer, which is just an incredible thing that we didn't have one. And Purdue didn't have one uh, at that time, because now it's a whole uh, entity onto itself uh, that we've got. So I think that. Uh, those are some of the things that I see that uh, people might not know about. Thanks, John. Yeah, and, and I just saw Chell this morning too. That's it's incredible. Twenty five hundred students in fall space day. That's just yeah. amazing. That's, that's great. Skip, what about something that happened while you were ahead that maybe you thought flew under the radar and didn't get quite the same notice you, that you, you might have expected it to get? Well, one thing that um, am I on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. One thing would be hiring faculty. Now, that may not seem to go unnoticed, but we hired 14 faculty when I was when, when I was head. Uh, seven of those are retirements, and what that let us do is bring in new people. In two areas in particular that are really affected. Back uh, when I was head, we had one person in propulsion who retired, and we struggled a long time to find a replacement for him. And that has, of course, turned out to be very successful. The propulsion, as we said, program has, has grown tremendously in facilities. So the fact that that group grew um, is important, but maybe it wasn't recognized at the time. The, the other area was was design. Back when I was head, we only had two people teaching design in the faculty. Professor Palmer taught the, the senior course, and Professor Marshall taught the, the sophomore course. And they were the only guys that taught propulsion. There wasn't anybody else teaching propulsion in the faculty, or excuse me, design in the faculty. The subsequent faculty have design has really increased. Now, I'm not sure how many people are teaching faculty now, but I bet you half of them are involved with, with, uh, with design. And we have another new design courses. So I think the fact that the design area grew and became important was a thing that, uh, sort of flew in front of the, under the radar. One other thing might be the, the um, Indiana Space Grant Consortium. And I wrote the first proposal for that in, in 91. John was director of that for a couple of years, and then John did, and then um, Dominic Andresani did it. That's a program which allows us to do a lot of outreach activities that we couldn't have done other other things. So I think that was kind of a low level thing, but it was important because it does let us do outreach. So those are things I guess come to mind for me. Yeah, that's great, Skip. And I know just from talking with Chelly, the space grants helping with the small space data we just talked about as one of those activities. So right, right. If, if I draw a thread from your discussion of design, I think I would argue that might have let me get the interview here back in 1995. So well, <laughs> it, it, it certainly did. And, you know, it's, it's, Difficult to think that there are only two people teaching design in the department, and they were the only ones who did it. And I don't think a lot of the other faculty weren't necessarily view that as a higher important part of the school, but it certainly has changed now. Now we've got a whole whole lot of us that are willing to and, and interested in teaching those different design right. courses, a bunch of different levels. And that's been a, that's right. been a great thing. Oh, Bill, Bill, yes, John. Uh, one other thing, as Skip said, one of the uh, real pleasures and maybe the most important thing we ever do is hire faculty. And what he didn't mention is that uh, he hired the previous head, Tom Ferris, and I hired the current head, Bill Crosley. 
okay. so, uh, somewhere in there we did something right. <laughs> so so let's see how does that work? So so who did Tom hire this to replace me, right? <laughs> well, you got to work on that. One, so. <laughs> well, you got to remember, you could be hiring your former boss. <laughs> your future boss. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. Well, so one of the things we wanted to talk about was you know, the, the school's place in aerospace and its success. And I think we've all had some comments about that, you know, that we've been successful for the past 75 years and things. So, you know, what, what did you use as a measure of success? When you were ahead, how did you know things were going well and we were being successful? I'll try to shake things up a little bit. So maybe Tom Ferris will ask you, I'll kind of just jump around a little bit so we're not always going in the same order. What was something when you were ahead that you said, yep, this means we're doing well? Uh, well, uh, Bill, Bill, as has been noted here, um, uh, the, the la lasting impact, and I hope you're thinking about this, right? Your lasting impact it is the faculty that you hire. Um, and uh, in, in, I think in part uh, through leadership from uh, then Dean, Dean Linda Katehi, we, we were able to uh, hire some more senior people who who came in and and had uh, uh, a very immediate impact, and uh, I think we were able to do that. that. That's one measure of the reputation that that the school had out there in the community that that people wanted to come and, and be a part of it. Also, some of the younger people that I hired, or you know, I can watch them from a distance and see. Uh, how successful they are now, but you know, just just things like, uh, and again, you hate to start mentioning names because you leave people out, right? So, so Bill Gerstenmeyer being being in charge of operations at NASA for so many years, um, uh, and and you know, the the notion that uh, we played such a leadership role at the various things that became the Boeing company, right? With Dave Swain's uh, serving as CTO for so many years and coming back and, and being uh, so good to the school. Uh, it, it's that the, the impact of the alumni, that, that's very real um, and, and is something that, that's always important to, to quantify uh, as you're going out there and and recruiting new students and and recruiting faculty, the uh, uh, Purdue Arrow it, it is out there in the world, and and it's it's just a very rewarding and gratifying uh, thing to think about. I can see these things going on that make makes me that makes me know that the school is successful. We still have you, Skip? Is the school successful? Yeah, what, what things when you were ahead, what, what, what did you use as a measure saying if you saw this going on, you knew the school was being successful? How did you measure right. success? Right, the tremendous interest in school. You know, there are always a lot of kids, trying to, students trying to get into, into uh, Aero and Astro. In fact, we had caps on it for a while. So that was important. But you know, there, there's, there's these polls that US News and World's has one of them is based on what academia thinks about you, but the one that I always thought was most important was what industry thinks about you. And we always rank very high in that, you know, two or three, you know, the top two or three of, the, of that. And I thought that was important because uh, it indicated the, what people thought about our product, the people that were going to hire students, what our alumni did, and so I, I always thought that the with the ratings that we rankings that we had in the industry was perhaps the most important thing that we, that we did. So, Tom Shee, what about you? What what things did you measure or use to say, hey, if this if I see this going on, the school is being successful? Well, uh, I guess uh, the question is, you know, why are we here? Of course, it is teaching, research, and service. And so, so I think it was already said by Tom and also Skip is um, our. Our, our alumni are incredibly accomplished, and we have a lot of students that want to continue to come to Purdue. So we have um, we have a wonderful tradition of outstanding education for our students. 
And the other one is our reputation on research and our faculty are among the top in the world. And we continue to, uh, to contribute in, in winning uh, research centers. So, we, so it shows that you know, our stature of faculty is extremely high. That's why I think our ranking is so high is that when people ask for the top people in the field, you know, we, we are the ones that, uh, that are often mentioned, our faculties are mentioned. Uh, we keep developing, you know, the, the best facilities like Struk was mentioned earlier, the quiet hypersonic tunnels and so on. So I think these are the things that uh, our alumni, our, uh, our students uh, accomplishments and also our faculty research and, and their impact. So I think that's how I, I measure it. And one more thing I think is very important. And this is something I inherited. And this is when I first came to Purdue that uh, really um, impressed me was the incredible culture of, of our department. Uh, collegiality, supportiveness, and, and and truly wanting each other to succeed. And even though we have the extremely high standards on on excellence, this does not push the upon people. But you know, each of us, I think, each of the faculty members, everyone wants to to be the best they can possibly be and have very very high standards. And yet, we're so supportive of each other, so nurturing each other. That's the part I think makes Purdue so wonderful. And that is also why I think we're able to recruit incredibly good faculty and retain them and also recruit outstanding uh, students. Great, thanks, Tom. John, what about you? What kind of measures or, or, or indicators of success did you look at? Well, I think uh, most of them have been covered, but one of the things that uh, has always uh, amazed me is how did this uh, incredible, excellent school of aeronautics and astronautics grow out of the bean fields of Indiana. You know, I mean, it's not logical in any way I can look at it, but what's logical and what did it was certain people along the way who promoted it and uh, got the resources. And uh, once the reputation is established, it's now drawing students from all over the world. Uh, and that's, of course, one of the things that Skip mentioned, we, we draw some of the best students uh, from around the country, the world, and even within Purdue, uh, we attract the best students within the College of Engineering coming out of freshman engineering. So I think that's a, a real measure. Um, industry was something we all worked on quite a bit. And uh, just the feedback and industry, the uh, uh, job fairs where hundreds of companies come in and recruit our students. Uh, it's just amazing to see also, and, and uh, it, it gives uh, our students, uh, both uh, undergraduate and, and graduate students, uh, all these opportunities for great jobs, not only in the industry, but within academia also. Thanks. I think that's been one of the things in my short time here that I see is that our students still go out and succeed and the opportunities are just huge, that, that, that we've got that reputation that means we're doing something well. So one of the things that, that, that we, we were talking about in the practice session before this got started, and Mark alluded to a little bit in his introduction of all of us, is that we've got basically you know, over 1,500 students in the school, and that that's, seems to be a measure of success. Everybody said that the students want to come here and things. So that's also a challenge. So when you served as head, what was one of the challenges you had? You know, it's a challenge for me to figure out how do we get the classes and how do we teach all of them and how do we cover that? Did you have similar challenges like that when you were head? What, what, what do you think was uh, something that was an important challenge for you that you had to had to address? Not necessarily negative. I think the, the high enrollment is a positive challenge. So is there something like that that you remember? I don't know. Maybe I'll start with you again, John, and just we'll go, go keep sort of doing roundtables. <laughs> well, I had the honor of uh, serving when we had the lowest student enrollment. We were down to... Uh, 300 total students. So it was a real challenge. There was challenges to uh, uh, roll the Aero School in, in what that mean. And uh, I think uh, Tom sort of addressed that. We just had a president and uh, administration said, no, Aero will always be at uh, Purdue. So that went away pretty quick. But recruiting students in a time when uh, industry to tanked uh, the not only commercial, but the military side of industry had gone down tremendously. Uh, it was true throughout the country. Uh, the meetings of the uh, Aerodynamic uh, uh, Chairs Association, uh, uh, all the heads would sit around and say, what can we do? And the only thing we can do is uh, when industry comes back. 
So but we did a number of things. We actually taught math courses uh, in the math department to uh, uh, show we could uh, uh, contribute uh, to the university. And when industry came back, we came back also. I think that uh, as we look forward, uh, with what's happening in industry right now, we may see uh, some uh, impact uh, on that also. But the other good thing is that we came out of it all right. And uh, uh, so that was the good part. So Skip, what do you think? What was something that maybe was a challenge that, that you had to face when you were ahead? Regarding enrollments? Well, it could be. I was thinking my challenge right now is that I see is the enrollment is the challenge. It's, it's, it's a good problem to have, but it is a challenge that I've got. So what were some pro challenges you might have had? I, I think that the enrollment issue, if you look at the history of our school, there's always peaks and valleys. And they go up and down, and it's really hard to, to uh, plan for the future what you're going to need. John alluded to it when in 1989, I guess the numbers here, 1989, we had 707 total students. Okay. 1997, we had 289 students. So in eight years, you know, in half, and then in 2003, it was up to 667. So just that tremendous variability in, in over a short period of time, it made administrative planning for staff, planning for faculty, uh, knowing what you're going to do in the future. It was, that was quite a challenge. And then, of course, all this when you had a lot of students, how are you going to how are you going to teach them, and what are your resources going to be? And I guess I would see that a big challenge for you. Looking in the past, you know, we had large word enrollments, but it could crash, and uh, I we need to think about controlling that. Yeah, we'll we'll, add, well I'll ask a little bit going forward about the future, but I, so that's that's a good for coming up topic. So Tom Ferris, what about you? What was, some, what was a challenge that you kind of worked through as a head? Uh, uh, Bill, when I, when I came along, um, facilities what, what was a huge challenge, right? I, I, uh, I, I, we, we speak about alumni. I, I, I still remember uh, dear Bob Bateman coming to my office. I hadn't been around very long, and of course, he, he was very visible on campus. He just pointed out to me that it it wasn't suitable for one of the world's best aero schools to be on the third floor of, of Grissom Hall. He always joked uh, he was going to challenge uh, President Beering to see if he could find us, see if President Beering would actually be able to find <laughs> where we were on campus. And um, we just stayed focused on that. We, we worked uh, closely with with Dick Swartz on that. We worked closely with Linda Gatehi on that. And, and all the faculty came together to really put together um, design for for our part of, of Armstrong Hall. I, I think we did a we did a very nice job with getting uh, John some some presence from the aerospace sciences laboratory into Weeks Hall just to kind of communicate that that was part of our school. We uh, we built the cave, the computing cave. Uh, it, the the facilities was just a huge challenge and and the faculty came together together i see steve stephen collicott on on the participants here right and uh, trust that the the drop tower is still in use and the stairwell and, and uh, armstrong hall it, that was a huge challenge tom she what about you well, I, I, I think I'm probably the luckiest chair. When I came, I think all my predecessor did an incredible job. <laughs> and um, But uh, maybe one um, minor challenge is the budget was kind of difficult when I, when I first came. Uh, but on that, I think our faculty um, uh, worked very hard. For example, I think Bill Crossley, you won the contributed quite a bit on the online education. I think that's something that helped us a great deal to address that issue. And also uh, our alumni, I think, came to help a great deal, even though they already helped um, in, with uh, building the, arm, the new Armstrong Hall engineering that Tom Ferris worked so hard on. <laughs> but, uh, so, but generally, I think our faculty, the thing that I felt the most, um, I mean, we have an incredible faculty that's so um, accomplished and, um, and top in their field, but our teaching load was also enormously high. And I, so every time we still want to do a lot of things, but it was still very, very hard because many of our faculty are teaching three courses, sometimes four courses a year and, and managing, advising 
10 graduate students. I mean, it's amazing the load of faculty. So, so as head, I always felt like, you know, we wanted to move forward even more. I mean, it's already an incredibly good school, but how do we go for even more forward? So it turns out it was very hard for me to ask people to do more. I think that was the most difficult challenge is faculty time. And uh, so what I did was it turns out to move forward, I basically, because our faculty do have high aspirations, they all want to do all kinds of things. And so, and so I think I actually did very little. All I did was when faculty want to do things, you know, we try to help enable it. And so we have a lot of new centers of excellence for it. And I think the, um, the faculty, all of them did all by themselves. And so we, we only try to support them. But on that, I also want to thank our alumni. So they really did help us enormously with their advice, with their energy, and also their connection to industry. I think John mentioned um, that we do have uh, incredibly good connection with industry. That's also a testament to the quality of our students and the, and the, and the excellence of our faculty. And so, and also, our, of course, alumni also uh, helped us a great deal with their uh, money as well in allowing us to, to move forward. So. And thanks, Tom. So the last set of questions or question topic that I had prepared was the future of the school and the future of aerospace. So, you know, looking ahead, what would you like to see for the school in the next 25 years? What do you think some of us will be talking about at the 100th anniversary of the school? Or if, not, if none of us, the people who will be in place after us, what will they be talking about at the 100th anniversary? Tom, you want to go first? Tom Shee? Yes, I'm actually very, very excited about uh, the future of aerospace. <laughs> uh, I'm in computational fluid dynamics. I think in today's world, I think computational physics, uh, digital twin uh, for design certification, I think for aircraft, I think that's a very, very exciting area. And so I think that is an area that I think I think would, would, would hugely impact us, you know, data science for line discovery, understanding mechanisms right now. Data science is, uh, it's hard for data science to, to they, they can show you trends, but it's hard to understand fundamentals. And I, I think when they are going to move in that direction, uh, aerospace sector will also be strongly affected by 5G, 6G, wherever that direction is going to be, AI autonomy, additive manufacturing, quantum communication, quantum computing. So, so I think we live in an extremely exciting time. And since lunar is something I think our department is leading for the college and the university, uh, that's something also very, very exciting. So, so, and gas turbine will stay around still for a long time and rockets and uh, we lead the nation in all those areas. So I think it's very, very exciting. Tom, Tom Ferris, I saw you nodding during that. So I don't know if that was uh, that you were resonating and you had something you're ready to, to what, what are we gonna be talking about in the next 25 years? Where do you think aerospace is going? Well, well, uh, one of the things to, to that that's great about uh, aerospace is it inspires uh, our, some of our best and brightest young people uh, to go into engineering, and uh, our graduates go from the aerospace from aerospace in, into so many things. So, you know, I'm I'm nodding my head to uh, Tom that. Um, uh, uh, the whole notion of drones and what drones will be doing and, and how that fits into so many applications around the data science and, and AI. It, it's really uh, very, very exciting. I think, I think the, the Aero School is, is right in the middle of that. Um, Bill, you, you may remember um, uh, this whole notion of uh, us worrying about where, where we fit into nano, info, and bio, and we started this rhyme of nano, info, bio, arrow. Right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, that, that's actually quite appropriate uh, uh, for us now. I, I, I think the, the sky is the limit uh, for the aerospace. Right? We're, we're actually building out on our aerospace program here at Rutgers. It, does, it, it just gets young people so excited. Skip, what about you? What, what, what do you think we'll be talking about over the next 25 years and what gets you excited about aerospace going forward? Well, I hope we're going to still be talking about students being tremendously excited about aerospace. You know, I, I agree that it's the magnet that attracts the best students and encourages them. And I'd like to think that we'll still be at the forefront of that. John, what about you? Well, as uh, Yogi Berra said, it's uh, tough to make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> so 
uh, it, we're in an era right now where the future is uh, is uncertain, certainly as it's ever been in, in my life, and uh, uh, you know predicting exactly what's going to happen. But I'm just in full agreement with uh, with all the other heads that uh, we have a field that's exciting for students. They see an airplane, they see a rocket, they see some other uh, aspect. Now they see drones or flying drones, and uh, it gets them excited. And they, uh, I think, will continue to uh, to come into the uh, aerospace field. I think the the other thing that's, that's there is autonomy, and that's a very uh, broad area. But currently, the school is uh, uh, concentrating on the area of autonomy a lot more. We mentioned cislunar also, but uh, I think all of these. Uh, uh, combined will give us uh, uh, enough different uh, areas that we can ex excel in. But keeping the good students coming is, a, is the uh, main thing that we need to do. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the students is, is clearly the, the pillar here, right? That's like you said earlier, I think it was you, John, that said what made such a great aero school in the middle of the corn and bean fields of Indiana. And we managed to do that and then students come from all over the world to the corn and bean fields of Indiana to study with us, which is which is really good. I mean, personally, I'm looking forward to how how do we once we get past COVID, how do we get back to using aerospace to make the world smaller, and how can we keep flying people around in a sustainable way? I think there really is some legs to that. It's really hard to beat the energy density of, of Jet A, um, but I think that's something that we're going to need to be looking at, and I hope we'll, we'll be playing a role in that going forward. Um, we did have a question. I'll, I'll start pulling some from the Q&A. There's not too many, but one of the questions was, in, in what directions should we take the next giant leaps? Now, we've hit, hinted on a couple of those. So what are some of the areas where the school is either, you think, is really well prepared to, to either maintain our, our, our lead or a place where we have an opportunity to, to, to sort of jump in and make our own field? I'm not sure where to start with that one. And I, nobody's nodding now because I said Tom Ferris nodded. I called on him. So... <laughs> John, you're smiling. Why don't you go ahead and, and give, it, give it a shot? I know you mentioned the autonomy. Are there other things you see where we would have some opportunity for leadership for us to take those giant leaps fitting in our Purdue kind of Well, model? like you, Bill, and you mentioned uh, the area of uh, electric airplanes, electric drones, or hybrids uh, is, is an area where Purdue in general can play a big role because we've got strong aero, we've got strong doubly power people. And I think if we can pull uh, those groups together, we can play a significant role as we uh, move towards more electric or totally electric uh, aircraft. Um, and well, the other thing is there are all all fuels. We've got the alternate fuel group uh, out at uh, Aviation Technology, but there's also now a incentive to look at hydrogen again, which hasn't been looked at since the '60s. So I think looking at some of these other power sources is uh, is, a, is an area where we could play a big role. You're muted. I'm muted. <laughs> I saw Skip was muted. I asked Skip and he, he didn't say anything. I'm sorry, Skip. What is, I was going to go you next, Skip. Sorry, my bad for the muting. Where do you think the school could, could take some of these next giant leaps and where we could have a leadership role or maintain our leadership role? Well, it's hard to decide on a specific leap, but I think that what the school really needs to do is make sure that we prepare students to be versatile to be able to handle the challenges when they get there. So that's what I think we really need to do. Okay. Tom Ferris, what about you? Uh, uh, well, you, you touched on it, um, uh, which is uh, we, we really don't have any idea of what's on the other side of the pandemic. And, uh, the notion of when will people actually be comfortable getting uh, on an airliner uh, again is, um, uh, I think that's that's huge for the school to think about it, it, in the immediate. Um, it, it's difficult to really, for many of us who, who were in the middle of trying to sort out the right thing to do for our students now, we, we recognize that we actually need to get the students back to campus. And I know Lou and Rutgers are in different places. Um, but 
but we have to balance that with all of the, of the safety of the students and the safety of our communities. It, it, it's, it's really a challenge for me to, to think beyond sort of right now, how are we going to get through the community regards to, to engineering education? And I, I see that uh, question from, from Scott Fogling as well about engineering education in the coming decade and what it's going to look like. You know, Skip and John both, and Bill, you've all alluded to this investment by the school into design, which is all around group projects. And, you know, we're actually designing facilities to get our students together. And now we've got a, a completely different way of getting our students as our new students. Yeah, I think those are big challenges. Hey, so Tom, she, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, that? That's, I guess, that's you know, well, let's let's mix some of those together because one of the challenges, questions in here is how does the Purdue Arrow program adapt to the ongoing pandemic, and, and then what's the single biggest challenge facing engineering education in the coming decades? So I think the big one right now, like Tom Ferris said, is how do we get through the pandemic? But what are some of the other things that that also fit our challenges for us in the education? Well, um, the, um, the pandemic has showed us that uh, online education is uh, pretty good. <laughs> and so we have, I think we do need to rethink about, or it could be quite good. It could be almost as good as on campus. And so, so if when the pandemic is over, we also have to make sure on campus education can, has what, well, I think the we will never return to the old normal. I think we have to rethink about how we give education. I think it's something that we have to think very hard about. You know, why if we can if we just give traditional lectures as we have been giving, if we can do that very well online, then you know why should students come on campus? So I think we do have to think very hard about it. Uh, one thing I, I I do want to mention uh, that was uh, mentioned by um, Skip is that to, to, we don't know what the future is going to be and. Um, and so we do have to educate our students with strengths and fundamentals and problem solving, you know, the traditional things we talk about and critical thinking so that they could be prepared for challenges when they do come. Uh, but for now, I think uh, on education, I think the way the world is now is that we're spending, remember people always says that universities will move very slowly, but, uh, but with this pandemic, I think universities are moving very, very quickly and adapting and, and being able to now educate uh, through online. And so I think we should take that energy and, and I'll sit down and rethink about how we do education, period. And, uh, how, and what is the best way to do it? I, you know, I, I, I don't know, I'm, but we need to talk to a lot of people, but I think there's something I think we need to spend some time uh, as, a, as, a, 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 as a community to think about how we can better educate our students and better use faculty time, better use uh, all the technologies out there so that uh, we can improve learning for our students. Uh, one thing I, I'd like to mention, uh, maybe slightly off, off topic, is when you were asking me uh, earlier, um, you know, what's, uh, what's under the radar that we didn't pay attention to? And I, I thought you think about things that are not the fantastic things that everybody knows about. So, so I'd like to mention a few things that's uh, maybe a little bit under the radar, but it's also things that, uh, uh, that we should be doing. So, for example, right now, one third of all the propulsion engineers at SpaceX, Blue Origin, are graduates who Purdue Sucre Labs. And so, so what have we been doing quietly? And how? So, the fundamentals, the things that we do well, and we have to continue doing. And also, some of the research, because we don't know what the future is. And um, so, some of the research at one time were not maybe so. Um, it's, it's not a hot topic. Right? So, so I like to mention Kathleen Howe's research. Uh, I'm not sure you know when the James Webb, the NASA's James Webb telescope, when it gets launched, you know they're going to fly using uh, Kathleen House uh, trajectories. So it was, it's it's Kathleen House research that's quite as she's been doing for decades, and that's what she's people are going to use. And Jim Garrison, you know the research he's working on the signal opportunities. Again, he's quietly working on the things. Well, NASA's eight satellite Cygnus constellations to study ocean surface waves lost in December uh, 2016 was, was his research. And, and so what I'm trying to say is, uh, and uh, Stephen Conicott, his stuff he does on microgravity, and he, he testified in front of Congress many times. And so what I'm trying to say is, one never knows what the future is. And so, so on topics, you really have to think very hard about. So we have to allow the faculty uh, to, to think about what to do. We can't force areas because, well, we may think it's important, may not be, 
But with that said, there are trends. And so, so Juan I sort of mentioned like autonomy and others mentioned autonomy and um, hypersonics and cislunar. These are things we know are moving in this direction. But as we all know, there are disruptive things, both in education and research. And I think we have to be open-minded. And so we have to let people and let faculty uh, explore many different areas and not limit people. And I think Purdue is one place that does value people who can think very openly and in very diverse ways. Yeah, so John, anything you want to add on that? Things things that are the challenges for us in education or immediate, maybe immediate post-pandemic thoughts? I think uh, Tom Ferris uh, brought up uh, COVID is uh, a big thing. I, COVID's in charge right now, you know, and uh, we've got to get through that. And once we get through it, I'm confident that the school will blossom again, normal way. But as Tom said, uh, it's going to be different. It won't be the old normal. Not only doing the teaching, but just all of our interactions will change. Just because we've had so many months of doing it differently, we're going to think uh, a lot differently about uh, most everything uh, that, that we do. But we've got to get through this. And getting through it, we still have some uh, uh, challenges uh, to keep it going at the uh, uh, at scale, I think, as our, our dean said, uh, how do we do this at scale? And uh, we're we're learning to do that, and we'll learn some more. But COVID is our challenge for the immediate future. There's no doubt. That Tom brought that up. Yeah, and we're learning. Like we're doing this all virtual instead of having it in the app. Like we joked before the thing, we're doing this all virtual. And I know you're actually down the hall, John, because I recognize yeah. your office, and I'm here. But that's because we can't be in the same room together right now, just because right. the uncertainty. Yeah. Skip, any thoughts from you on that? Challenges for engineering education and maybe some thoughts also about the pandemic and how we get through that. Well, quite frankly, I'm glad I'm not having to worry about that actively. You know, I've been through times. <laughs> Six years, I'm glad I'm not, not in your, your position now. Uh, it's just a very scary thing to think about how to do all that, how to do all this. I think the, the faculty have been, in this, and the students, to be on, on, on both sides of that equation, the students in the school have been really quite, compared to anecdotes I hear from other colleagues, our, our students have stepped up. Nothing's, nothing's been perfect. There have been challenges, but our students have been pretty good about recognizing it's as hard for us on the faculty side as it is for them on the student side. Different challenges, but still very, very daunting to do this. I think we're, we're accommodating pretty well. You know, one of the things I think about that too, and, and I think a few of you have hit on this a little bit. One of the challenges also thinking about going forward is how do we maintain that core fundamentals of aerospace, which takes a lot of time and a lot of experience in the classroom. And how do you add the data science and how do you add the uh, um, autonomy topics and how do you add electric propulsion and batteries and, and things we aren't traditionally aerospace. That seems like that's a challenge also. I don't know how we do that well. Any, any thoughts about that one? It kind of fits one of the questions here. It was one of the prepared questions I had. Tom, Tom Shee, I know, is smiling because I think Tom Shee and I have had this discussion that I think sometimes it's hard to describe what is the fundamentals. You kind of know it when you see it, but it's really hard to say this is the box I can draw around it. Do you have a thought, Tom Shee? Since you're nodding, see, you nodded, so I can call on you. <laughs> well, I mean, during our my head during the last ten years, I think that's what our faculty keeps talking about, right? Even though people say the curriculum hasn't changed much, but the fact is our faculty is passionate about giving our students the best possible education. So we've been thinking about that very hard. I mean, Bill, you are the leaders looking at the list of requirements, you know, what do we, our students must understand, how do we bring it in? And the, but the question always, what do you take out? And so I think we've been thinking about a lot of things. The question is, of course, is faculty time, can we do it? But well, I think one idea, well, I think some things we have done now already is we, we change, for example, how we teach AE 400. And uh, so we are trying to, you know, how we use our advisory boards, the IAC, the SAC, so they can help us ethic, bring topics that we don't typically cover or don't traditionally cover in our curriculum. And also we, we I, I, I thank uh, the uh, Bill Yurik and uh, uh, Anastasia Vernas Hesche, which allowed us to create a, a distinguished um, short course series to, to cover special topics. These are things we have done. But the other ideas I think our faculty have talked about extensively is one, when credit courses. So right now we in our department we're demanding uh, two step two course step sequence courses in every you know all traditional disciplines. 
And uh, so it's it only uh, sort of prepares one class of students. But if we can break into a bunch of uh, one credit courses, say for example, but you have to redo everything. You can't do just that one part of your introductory course, but those you have to redo our thinking. If we do our one credit courses that give introductory material. And then uh, so the students, if you have uh, say, um, uh, say one class of three um, uh, modules, each one credit, and, and, you, and then students can pick and choose. And if we do this way, so we can have maybe the three credits organized in such a way so that you'll get a very good introductory uh, to our traditional disciplines. And if you want to specialize in the traditional way, you can keep doing it. But for those of us, who, for those of students that want to say, I want to be a designer, and aerospace engineering, as Tom Ferris said, is incredibly broad. We're the one that brings everybody together. You got to know double E, you got to know computer science, you got to know ME stuff, you got to know everything. You, you had to bring all together. So for those students, they can take modules in other areas, but that means we also need modules from double E, modules in computer science, and we need you know, business, marketing, all those other things and, and policies. And so, so I think we have to completely rethink about how we do our curriculum. Do you have any thoughts about that? You're, 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 you're... Since you've been retired for a little while, maybe you're a little further from it, but but how do we keep doing the fundamentals that we did so well when you were here? And then also try to add in some of these other things that everybody's, uh, we all agree, need to be part of what the students see. Well, we need to understand what the fundamentals are and how they're used in industry. You know, we've been in academia, we've been involved in basic research, fundamental research. But that's got to be applied in some way, and I think you need to understand the application process, how that works, you know, how industry is going to translate basic stuff to a piece of hardware, and you need to see the big picture and understand how that's going to work. Wow. Students need to know how, if they're doing basic research, how it's eventually going to be picked up by somebody, and how it's going to be used, and not just write journal papers that nobody reads. So you need to understand the transition of fundamentals to actual hardware, how that's done. So John, I know you said you spent some time at Boeing, but probably gave you a little window into that. What are, what's your thinking on this? How do we how do we do this, ensure the fundamentals yet still provide these new topics? Well, I think Skip brought up uh, earlier design. And, uh, you talked about it and actually Tom Ferris did also. I believe we put design in our curriculum without taking anything out. We added a lot of design problems, a lot of exercises. And I think there's other things we can do uh, to incorporate some of the newer areas within the basic courses. And uh, the other thing is there's stuff we dearly hang on to that we shouldn't be doing anymore. And uh, we need to ferret those out. Uh, by example, as an ME, uh, talking to one of my colleagues over there, and they were still using steam tables. Really using steam table stuff? It seems like there's a better way to do that. And I think as I look at our curriculum, I see spots where we could make some changes and add some of the other topics uh, to that without uh, uh, decreasing anything from the fundamental. Tom Ferris, you're, you're, I haven't asked you about this one yet. Do you ever thought about this? Um, uh... Bill, it, it's, uh, uh, I think John touched on it now. So, so we have all of these, um, I'll, I'll use the word simulation, I'll use the word engineering design, whatever. We have, we have very powerful computational tools, which, which we can now put on the student's uh, laptop. And just this, this notion about how you balance uh, encouraging the students to use them, but at the same time, understanding some fundamentals so that they they go through a, a process of verifying and validating the computations that they are doing. Um, I, I think um, there's an opportunity for us there to make it really exciting. Uh, Bill, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, yeah, you've been forward. Go right ahead. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, the, the fundamentals has to be there because if you don't have good fundamentals, uh, 
we're, we're not going to get anywhere, right? And and as Tom Ferris also mentioned, if you don't know, if you you can do all the simulation, but uh, if you don't have the insight to understand what you're looking at, <laughs> if you don't have the insight to know even the solutions are right or wrong, because we know a lot of the computational tools, they give you an answer. And uh, even though the tool itself has been validated, when you apply it incorrectly, just like by instrumentation, LDV or PIV, you could still use it incorrectly, you could still generate junk. And so you really have to understand physics well. And the fundamental is critical, but I think a lot of the stuff we need to add as aerospace engineers, there are still certain disciplines. I think the industry expects us to have that expertise. And so I think that expertise, we have to make sure we provide our students. But I think the world is changing quickly. And so there are those other areas and they don't have to be experts in it. And so those are the areas I was hoping maybe take one or two courses, one or two credit courses is enough for us to have that understanding so that we will have the knowledge so that we can work with those engineers and so we can bring the whole package together because it is the aerospace engineer that brings the system together. And, and also, I think one more thing about today's world in aerospace engineering is no longer just one spacecraft or one aircraft, it's, it's a system. It, Everything's connected, right? And so, so it's the, 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 even the aerospace sector is changing enormously. So. Right, it has been. So now we're getting close to 12.30 here. Let me, let me read one of the questions. It's on a slightly different topic. One of our students saw that we heard and saw that we talked a little bit about hiring and how we, some of the new areas enabled us to hire more women faculty and that's opened the doors there. But, but there's there really, we have limited racial diversity in the faculty here. And we don't have any underrepresented minority faculty. I know that's a challenge, and it's been a longstanding challenge. And I've been very vocal about trying to figure out how to how to change that. So, do you have some thoughts and comments about, you know, how, what are ways to do this? This is not an easy problem. Talking talking about it alone is not enough. But if we don't talk about it, we we won't change it. So, what are some ways we we change our racial makeup in the in the faculty? How do we attract? people of color and, and black engineers to, to the faculty. Any, anyone want to volunteer on that one? I could ask, I, I assume Tom, Tom Ferris is smiling, but I assume you're thinking about this quite a bit too as a, as a dean and your role as dean and all of us as head have thought about this. I don't know if you have insights for us, Tom Ferris or? But you know, uh, Bill, we, we, we just all have to get more comfortable uh, about acknowledging the, the systemic racism in this country and and the impact that it's had on the academy and um, it, it's sort of uh, unfortunately without going red or blue right the, the political discourse in this country is is so divisive right now but we, we just really have to get comfortable with with acknowledging what you just said right the the systemic racism is limiting what we can do as a as a country, as what what the school can do, and and limiting the opportunities for for so many kids out there. So it, it's it's good that you brought that up. It's you know maybe we should have brought it up earlier in this conversation. Um, uh, Rutgers is in an interesting place now. We we just appointed a new president. Uh, Jonathan Holloway, who was provost at, at Northwestern. Uh, Jonathan's black. He played football at Stanford, and he's a, actually a, a historian of, of the post-Reconstruction South. So he's bringing some very uh, interesting perspectives of this to us. And uh, uh, he just started on July 1st, so I, I'm looking forward to seeing where his leadership takes us. But it, 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 this is a huge issue that we have to and talk is not enough, but it is a start. So thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, a colleague, I, in fact, I think it was Eric Stalmer who talked to us from the Commercial Space Flight uh, Federation. We, 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 sort of, we were talking offhand before, before this, but we, we looked and said, yeah, the aerospace industry tends to be, he used the words pale, male, and stale, meaning that we're white <laughs> and we're male and we're getting old. and and. In a good way, Tom, you referred to me as being young, although I'm not officially young anymore. <laughs> but, but I mean, that, and that sort of sets the point, right? That, I, that, that none of us on the call are young anymore, right? And, and a lot of the industry looks like us. Other thoughts from, from John or Skip or Tom Shi? Uh, Bill, and maybe I, just a comment. I, I think um, 
you know, when, when you want to improve, it's, it's never just one thing that you do, right? So it's a continuous thing. It's, it's a cultural thing. And uh, I think Tom Ferris said that very well. That's something I think we have to understand and we have to address those very fundamental issues. But I mean, if you just look at some of the success our department has had in other areas, like Trucro and what Kathleen, it takes enormous amount of time to get to where we are today. And so, and I know during my tenure and also my president's tenure, I know we all tried very hard and we're not always successful. And, but one thing, so I think we have to work. Uh, so one thing, for example, I'm very grateful to Lena Alexanko, for example. And so she's working on this Amelia Earhart uh, summit and we have to do things little by little in other areas to get people started. And also now because the base 11, I, I think Steve Huster and uh, Tim Porpoint, those folks and Bob Luck to, to work with Morgan State. And so you have to start working, developing relationships. And uh, and, and now, if, by the way, when, when I remember I talked to the provost at Morgan State and he says, Tom, I don't want to, to, um, to give you my best faculty. You know, when we try, I want them back to that Morgan State. If you get a PhD from Purdue, they're not gonna come back to Morgan State. So it has to be a win-win, right? They have the same challenges and they also want to improve. So I think, we have to work together uh, with other universities and slowly build up. And so eventually we could uh, move in that direction. So, so it is little by little, always doing the right things. Bill, you're on mute again. Yeah, I got muted. I, I think I think it's, it's fine. I think when there's feedback, I'm, I'm getting some help being muted. That's okay. No. <laughs> so John, I saw you nodding a little bit as Tom was speaking. Are, are there thoughts you have on this? Like, how, how do we change this? We need to change this because we don't look like the society we serve. I think two things that uh, Tom said. One, uh, it's a long-term problem. It's been a problem certainly since I was had or Skip was had. Um, we need it address it across the board uh, as, as Tom she said the uh, relationships with uh, uh, other uh, historically black universities would help us an awful lot we've got some connections with them but uh, we uh, need to do more there but I think that uh, go back to one of my favorite things was fall space day and that's a, another place where we can start building a pipeline of students that would be uh, attending Fall Space Day. And then, uh, uh, well, maybe coming back to Purdue, but, but going into uh, STEM areas. Uh, and we really haven't concentrated uh, particularly on certain schools or certain neighborhoods. And that may be uh, one way to, to uh, start putting more people in the pipeline. Because now when we go out to find somebody, the number of people uh, that fit the criteria we're looking for is pretty small. And so we don't have uh, a lot of choices. So somehow to improve uh, the, uh, uh, the mix so that we do have more choices would help a lot. Skip, any thoughts from you on this? Well, I agree with John is getting more people to come into the program. Young students starting early, getting them to come, getting our recruiting students. I think that's where it starts. And we, we have been working on that. I, there's, we don't have enough details yet, but we're, we're trying to pursue some scholarships and things to help with the access for underrepresented students. And so that hopefully that will help here at Purdue. We are engaging, we're pretty far along on a discussion with Morgan State so their students could get a degree from Morgan State. They don't have an aerospace engineering program, they could get a degree from Purdue. We've started a few initial discussions with NCA and T because they're part of the university, they're actually leading the university leadership initiative that Purdue's part of. So there's been some discussions there. So we're working on some of those. Those are really important things, I think, that we we can't ignore. And you're right, it, as all of us have said and all of us know, it's it's not something that'll get fixed overnight. It's something that we have to work on with some, some time. So this actually isn't a question, but many of us know Mark Sleppy. He posted this in the Q&A. And he says, John, when you stayed at a premier aerospace research university where I was out of the bean fields of Indiana, you know, he, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but he's a farm boy from Indiana, and it gave him a chance to, to, to come south and a little bit west to West Lafayette, and now off is, is a you know, senior tech fellow out of Boeing, and so just the impact that, that Purdue has had on students. So maybe as we wrap up here, what are some of those stories that, that you have that, that made you know you were doing the right thing? And I'll give you my example first. It's, it's been written up a couple of times, but I remember traveling to Boeing for a visit 
and it was a quick in and out. So I didn't tell anybody I was coming because I know too many people in Seattle. But I got spotted in the in the Twin Towers building, as they call it, and we were taking a tour of the of the the floor of the assembly building up at Everett. And a group of students came running up and said, Professor Crossley, Professor Crossley, can you get on our, our airplane? Because they've been working on the 787 and we got to go on one of the 787-9 test airplanes. And that was one of those moments where I knew, yep, this is why I was doing what I was doing. So what are some of the moments like that for you guys? Well, Bill, um, before I start, I'm just going to say that what Tom Ferris said that when you mention names, something you forget. So, so on the diversity issue that you mentioned earlier, I just to mention I, I forgot to mention Dan Tarantas' incredible efforts with NCANT that started this university leadership initiative with NASA. So, so again, everything takes time to develop. But, but on, um, I think the moment that I think because I'm from the outside, so when I come to see Purdue, I'm just incredibly impressed. But I remember a conversation with Dave Schwein. And Dave Schwein said, I, I asked him, I said, uh, you know, we're just talking. And he says, uh, he, he was talking to me about Gus. He says, you know, uh, I, when I was a student, and he said he came from a very, very small high school. He was a top one for it, but there's so few students in his high school. And he comes to Purdue, and Purdue has this incredibly good student from all around the country. And uh, he said, you know, I, I have a final exam in hypersonics, and I have interviews. So I, I, I asked, uh, uh, Gus, if I can um, maybe take that exam another time. And Gus said, yes, if and only if you do it on a Saturday morning and as long as I want. And so, so uh, Dave Schwein came and um, he came for the test and, 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 and the Gus and Dave told me after three questions, he found that he doesn't know anything. But after the exam, she knew everything. <laughs> and I think that just reminded me of what I think what Skip and John and Tom and you have all said is, I think we're incredibly nurturing and caring department. We really care about the education of our students. And look how wonderful Dave Schwein became, right? And I think that's why I think I love Purdue. And it's, it's just an incredibly good place. And I think that's why we're also so good. Thanks, Tom. Skip, do you have a story like this? One of those where you just knew this 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 is why you did what you did and why you got into to teaching at Purdue. Well, a little different one, maybe. I, I had an involvement with the Australian Air Force. Uh, they started sending students, active duty students, to Purdue. And that program started 25 years ago and it's still going. When I look at what they did, and uh, that, that just was rewarding. To, to see what what the, what they've gone on and done and uh, how they've impacted the, the structural integrity of of the, the, of the airplanes, or you go to a conference and you see your students presenting papers. I don't know if there's any specific thing. John, what about you? Uh, got a, 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 it doesn't have to be a specific thing, I guess, but just sort of to kind of wrap this up. Like, what are some of the joys that you've you've had? And well, I think like uh, you said and uh, others, uh, seeing your students succeed. Uh, for me, one of the things that happened when I was at uh, NASA, I did a lot of traveling. Every week I traveled and mostly traveled with uh, other NASA people. And we'd be walking through the airport and several people would come up, oh, Professor Sullivan, remember me? You know, I graduated in 87. Uh, well, maybe I don't quite remember you, but... <laughs> It was, and they got to the point where, you know, colleagues from NASA would say, "You know, everybody." I said, "No, I just know the students that uh, were at Purdue, and they are in the field." And so we were going to other NASA facilities or uh, uh, Seattle lots of times. So there, that's a place where you would run into other uh, aeronautical uh, people, and uh, it was just such a, a joy to see them, and uh, uh, actually also to see the reaction of NASA people that, in fact, the students were all around from Purdue. Thanks, John. Tom? Uh, you know, Bill, I, I know the, the uh, AIAA conferences now are of a different form than back when I was very active with you. But, you know, when we, when we would go to, to SDM, the Structure, Structural Dynamics and Materials Conference, the, the whole thing was run by Purdue grads. And we were just throughout all of the sessions and it it really made you feel good about 
about what's going on at Purdue. And, and so many of our, uh, my, my own students that have gone on and, and are doing very cool things and, and you've rec rec recognized many of them, but I will put, put in a plug. Um, many of you may remember uh, Pam McVay. Pam is, is really in charge of the uh, uh, structures of the International Space Station uh, at where she is at Boeing and uh, is in a very low key way is again doing some very cool things for for Purdue. That's great. Thanks, Tom. So I have one more post that showed up in the Q and A. It's from Charlene Edinburgh, who's one of our alums, and, and she she says she's just echoing your point, Tom. Tom, she that. The education really must have a systems engineering approach, which makes sense for us as, as aerospace engineers. What do we need now? What do we think they need in the future? And use that like as a requirements based approach. And so just a just a following up and supporting your point on that time. So I don't have any more questions posted. I, I want to thank all of you for spending the time with us today. It's it's been incredibly fun. It's it's neat to have my predecessors. Mark Lundstrom did tell me I should use this to get some information. So I'm I've been taking some notes. I'll go back and watch the recording a few times <laughs> to make sure I've got some tips. But thank you so much for being part of helping us celebrate the 75th anniversary this year. This is, this is great. So Tom Shee, thank you. Tom Ferris, thanks to you. John, you're down the hall. Thanks for doing this. And Skip, thanks for calling in for your home. I really appreciate it today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank I really you, appreciate Bill. it. This was wonderful. Thanks to all our audience as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Bye.